So good afternoon and a warm welcome to the Institute for Advanced Study. This is the fourth event of the lecture series, Scholarly Correspondences Among Orientalists during the early and late modern period as historical source. We are glad you could join us. Let me just provide some housekeeping rules at this point. We ask that you keep your microphones muted. We will be using the chat for questions and comments. Please feel free to add them during or at the end of the talk. And I'm now very happy to introduce today's speaker, Kinga Divenyi, who joins us today from Budapest, Hungary. Kinga Divenyi is the former curator of the Kaufmann and Goldseer collections in the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and former associate professor of Arabic and Islamic studies at Corvinus University of Budapest. She has published on a wide range of topics, noteworthy among other publications are her studies on al faraz Ma'ani al-Quran, her numerous studies on Ignaz Goldsia, and her catalog of the Arabic manuscripts in the Library of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, published 2016 with Brill. And now, Kinga, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, first of all. Uh to Sabine and Maria for organizing this exceptionally diverse and exciting series of talks uh, and uh, for inviting me to participate to present a brief overview of the correspondence of Ignaz Goldziher, one of the founders or even the founder of, of Islamic studies in Europe. The correspondence, uh, as many of you may know, contains about 13,500 letters and postcards sent to Goldsier by over 1,600 of his friends, students, and colleagues in a multitude of languages and concerning very different topics. Although we did not gather today to discuss Goldsier's scholarship or evaluate his oeuvre, a few things about his life should be mentioned that may help us to understand his correspondence. It is not an easy task to talk about Goldsier since much has been written during the past century about him as a scholar, his embeddedness in 19th century Jewish scholarship, and after the publication of his Tagebuch, even about his psychological traits, as could be gleaned from the pages of this diary, started on his 40th birthday and continued until 1919 in German. His correspondence has also been receiving ever increasing attention in the past decades, resulting in the addition of several of his correspondences partially or in their entirety. Gaultier did not hail from a family of scholars, his ancestors being merchants, allegedly in Toledo, then later in Hamburg and Burgenland. It was his father who moved to the town of Székesfehérvár in Hungary. The young Ignat proved to be a child prodigy, and his above the average IQ translated to above the average professional success as an adult, even if he sometimes felt otherwise, and despite his circumstances that for most of his life were far from the ideal. At the age of four, he could already read. By the age of five, he had finished reading the book of Genesis in Hebrew, and while attending elementary school in his native city, and with the help of private tutors, he delved more deeply into Jewish, especially Talmudic studies. One of his teachers being a certain Boses Wolf Freudenberg, who also who was also the first correspondent of Goldsier. His letters uh, are preserved in the correspondence. Among them, uh, this letter written. This is the first letter written in 18, which is preserved in 1863. On the slide, you can not only see the letter, but also Gaultier's stamp, obviously stamped much later uh, than the date of the letter. Uh, it is upside down <laughs> on the letter, um, but here it is, and you can read uh, what it refers to. It is a passage from the Quran, uh, and um, it's very interesting uh, from uh, Surat Yusuf. Uh, which was one of Gaultier's favorite uh, surahs. Um, Gaultier published his first uh, booklet of 19 pages at the age of 12. When he was 15 years old, the family relocated to Pest, 
a move which gave him the opportunity to engage more fully in study and research. First, as a special order student at the Royal University of Pest, where he became the first student of Arminius Vanberi, learning mainly Turkish and Persian from him. As for Arabic, he learned it from the popular textbooks of the time. In addition to his diary, Gautier's later ambivalent relationship with Vanberi is well reflected in the correspondence or lack thereof. The year of the Austro-Hungarian Compromise, 1867, was also the year of Jewish emancipation in Hungary. Article 17 of the Bill of 1867 and the enlightened policy of the Minister of Education, who foresaw in him a distinguished teacher of Semitic languages, made it possible for Gaultier to pursue further studies abroad with a governmental stipend. First, from 1868 at German universities in Berlin and Leipzig, then in Leiden and finally in Vienna. From the beginning, his university studies were accompanied by an intensive study of Arabic manuscripts, by which he acquired an erudition which later became widely admired by his contemporaries. His archive, which has become online uh, at the, by the end of last year, his archive reflects well the speed with which he devoured manuscript after manuscript, making copious notes that he could rely upon in his later publications. Such were Gaultier's talents that it was in Leipzig, in exchange for his cataloging of a group of Arabic manuscripts at the age of 20 for the bookseller's list on Franke, that he got his cherished copy of Freytag's four-volume Arabic-Latin lexicon compiled in the 1830s. Gaultier, as you can see on the slide, has amplified the entries and corrected others throughout his life. During the Second World War, it was preserved by his last student, Joseph de Chomoli, who had walled it up in the wine cellar of his family house, as we can read it in his 1961 article entitled My Reminiscences of Ignaz Gautier. Gautier returned to Hungary at the end of February 1872 after his approximately four year European study tour. And in the autumn of the following year, he embarked on his Eastern study tour with a scholarship from the Ministry of Education. He first spent a few months in Damascus where in addition to making many friends in the bazaars, he also found the possibility to copy several manuscripts, many of which formed the basis of his future articles as well. His main patron in this respect was a certain Mustafa Sibai, a learned free thinker, and not to be confused with his much later namesake, uh, he was director of the religious foundations in Syria for the benefit of Mecca and Medina, who enjoyed great respect among the Damascene intelligentsia and who put his rich library at the disposal of the young Hungarian scholar. Gautier was not only extremely knowledgeable in literary Arabic, but was also familiar with some of its spoken dialects. This knowledge, together with his enthusiasm, has helped him in forging lasting friendships with his acquaintances in Damascus and later in Cairo, where, Apart from visiting the library, though he was non-Muslim, he soon received permission that allowed him to attend lectures at the Azhar Mosque. This period of unclouded happiness spent in intensive studies suddenly ended in early 1874 when he received news of his father's serious sickness. In the following years, he drew strength from the box full of books which he bought and took back for himself and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. After obtaining uh, his doctorate in Leipzig, he started teaching at the University of Pest in 1872. But his promotion to the chair of Semitic philology was thwarted by the death of his patron, the Minister of Education. That is why, to make ends meet, he accepted in 1876 to take up the position of secretary of the Neolog Jewish community of Pest. 
where he engaged wholeheartedly in the religious instruction, which in those days was compulsory for all children and to which Goldseer attributed fundamental significance in transmitting Jewish identity. His private correspondence also serves as a proof of this activity. And here you can see a selection of letters uh, from the community. If we want to browse the different layers of Goldseer's correspondence, we should turn our attention to his scholarly achievements and provide a brief general overview. This is important from the point of view of his scholarly correspondence, since his engagement in several distinct fields of three different disciplines inevitably widened the circle of his correspondence. It should be pointed out that Goldseher made lasting contributions to Islamic, Arabic, and Jewish studies alike. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on a 13th century Hebrew lexicographer, while his first major book, which appeared in 1876, dealt with Hebrew mythology. Although later the focus of his research shifted to Arabic and Islamic studies, he never completely abandoned Jewish studies and was especially interested in comparing Judaism and Islam and in dealing with Arab Jewish philology. In the field of Arabic studies, his first extensive articles dealt with linguistics. In this field, he was most interested in etymology. And in addition to his lengthy articles in foreign languages, he was fascinated throughout his life with Hungarian words of Eastern origin, with comparative Semitic linguistics and with Judeo-Arabic texts. From among his grammatical works, mention must be made of his comprehensive study in Hungarian on the Arabic linguistic tradition, unparalleled in European Arabic studies, which appeared in English translation only in 1994. His archive reveals that Goldseer started to copy Ibn al-Anbari's work on the two grammatical schools of Basra and Kufa uh, in Leiden. Uh, sorry, I, I have to go back to the previous slide. Yeah, uh, you can see uh, on the right uh, side of this slide, uh, a page from uh, archive of Goldseher, uh, where he started to copy Ibn al-Amberi's work on the two grammatical schools of Basra and Kufa. And as you can probably decipher on the slide, uh, he started to copy it when he had a terrible toothache. While in his youth, he seems to have been preoccupied with linguistics for various reasons, he did not bring to fruition these early tentative editions, generally abandoning the projects, perhaps apart from his above mentioned Hungarian monograph. He has an excellent grasp of the most diverse themes and devoted a book and numerous long papers to the history of Arabic literature as well. In this field, he was primarily occupied with pre-Islamic and early Islamic poetry. Among his historical works, we find comprehensive studies as well as treatments of different periods from the ancient history of Semitic peoples and Arabia up to the modern age. In an outstanding geographical study, he attempted to synthesize literary and geographical knowledge by analyzing the toponyms associated with Antara, an epic hero of Arabic literature. Gozia regularly wrote reports on archeological excavations in the region and apart from all this, he had several smaller works, including more than 200 reviews, which show his diverse interest in the high intensity of his work, which is also shown by the map on the slide, because he found time to, to fix the names uh, on this map showing the caliphate. Islamic studies have always been at the forefront of Gaultier's interest. He was the first to treat Islam as an independent discipline within Oriental studies and make it suitable for modern scientific inquiries. His activity covered all significant aspects of Islam and disclosed his results to the world in influential books and scholarly articles. The six chapters of his first comprehensive study, Islam, which appeared in Hungarian in 1881, 
already contained within their far-reaching topics the embryos of the cardinal ideas of his later crucially important monumental German language books. In the same book, he touched briefly on the connection between Islamic architecture and religion, as well as on the relation between Islam and science. In his main works on Islam, he dealt in detail with several crucial questions, Islamic jurisprudence, Hadith studies, schools of Quranic exegesis, the cult of saints, as well as the different religious schools and movements. In this connection, he published several text editions, such as the biography of Hadith narrators supposed to have lived to an advanced age, the theological handbook of the Almohads, the last dynasty of Western Islam, and the polemical treatise written in the 11th century against the esoteric teachings of the Ismailis. Several of his treatises dealt with the Shiites, a topic rarely discussed in those days by European Orientalists. He based these studies on some manuscripts he copied in Damascus. In another study, he compared Iberian and Eastern Islam, being the first to point out the decisive importance for the development of Islamic civilization in Spain of knowledge brought from the Eastern Islamic lands. He also wrote extensively about popular beliefs in Islam and the wide range of other topics. A basic characteristic of his work was his deep knowledge of Arabic manuscript sources on which he relied and quoted widely to support his arguments. This was especially important in his days when Arabic text editions were rarely accessible. His interest in acquiring Arabic manuscript, manuscripts did not stop at his young age. He was corresponding with various scholars on this topic and was involved in different projects concerning manuscripts until the very end of his life, as is proven by his correspondence. He was also well acquainted with Arabic religious literature already available in print, where he frequently found corroboration for his thought. Thanks to this, most of his hypotheses have endured and remained relevant until today. Moreover, he made use of the latest Western theories and religious studies and did not ignore the Christian and Islamic reform movements closely following their development. In his critical analysis, he confidently used the theories and methodology of contemporary literary and social sciences, especially the historical and comparative methods that he incorporated into his own field. Goldziher played an active role in the social and scholarly life of Hungary. Like his university career, his relationship with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences began at a very young age, but in the case of the Academy, it proceeded along a reasonably balanced and smooth path. In 1876, he became corresponding member and in 1892, ordinary member. And in 1905, he was elected president of section one, that of linguistics and literary scholarship. In 1911, he became a member of the board of directors of the Academy. He had close connections with the library of the Academy as well. He helped to expand the library holdings by purchasing important books. He wrote the first report on the Hebrew manuscripts and books in the David Kaufman collection, and one could always count on his expertise when cataloging books in Semitic languages. From 1883, he regularly attended the international congresses of Orientalists and historians of religion. On such occasions, as a rule, he was the life and soul of the party and kept the conversation going with his delicate, never offending wittiness. At the Orientalist Congress in Stockholm, he received the greatest distinction of his life by being awarded the large gold medal of the Congress. His international fame and his esteem are evidenced by the festivities issued at major anniversaries of his life, together with the tabula gratulatoria prepared for his 60th birthday, containing names of almost 200 scholars from all corners of the world. In the preface of a volume, which appeared in Strasbourg in 1912, 
celebrating the 40th year of his university service, Theodor Nerdaka praised his unrivaled knowledge of medieval Arabic and Islamic sciences. After his death in 1921, Ignaz Gossier's position as definitive master of his field was maintained and he is still considered to be one of the most influential European authorities. This is clearly evidenced by the frequent republishing and translation of his works and the references to them even in recent publications. His books and most important articles have appeared in all the major European languages and have also been translated into Arabic, Hebrew, Turkish, Persian, Urdu, and Indonesian. Due to his attachment to the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, it is no wonder that Goldsier's correspondence and his other literary remains were donated to this scholarly body in 1926 by his son Károly after the death of his mother at the end of the previous year, whose will it was that these documents find a permanent home there. But already before that year, his library was acquired by the newly founded Hebrew University of Jerusalem. The Goldsier Library, which formed the nucleus of what is today the Islam and Middle Eastern collection of the National Library of Israel, opened in September 1924 to the public with a festive celebration in Jerusalem. Shortly after the First World War, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences lacked the necessary funds to obtain a library of this scale, when even valuable donations were only accepted after special investigations into the nature of the bequest, the possible costs of transfer, cataloging, etc. The documents from the Goldsier archive were transported to the Academy in a huge sealed crate from Goldsier's home in Hollow Street on the 18th of January. 1926. In his letter to the Secretary General of the Academy, Karoy also offered his services to arrange and catalog the still unsorted material. The uniqueness of Gossier's correspondence lies in its size, content, the diversity of the topics discussed, and the identity of the persons who corresponded with him. One of his preeminent students, Joseph de Chamoudi, who I have already referred to, and who after his emigration to the United States was teaching at Harvard and Brandeis, remembered the importance of correspondence for Ignaz Gautier in his above mentioned article, quoting the words of his master saying, I quote, two things I enjoin on you if you want to prosper in life. Answer every letter, or card you receive, even if your answer be negative, and take part in the Orientalist Congresses with lectures. This is as important as literary work. The Academy repeatedly thanked Karoy for the valuable donation, emphasizing that scholarly correspondence is a highly important source for the development of our intellectual life and the advances made in the field of Oriental studies, as can be read in a letter of the Secretary General to Cairo dated the 12th of January, 1926. Despite all this sincerely grateful attitude, nearly six years have passed in complete silence until Sir Oral Stein, the Hungarian British Orientalist, archeologist and explorer of the Silk Road suggested to the Academy that they make accessible the correspondence for scholars from all the four corners of the world. Based on this initiative, Cairo Gautier started working on the catalog of his father's correspondence at the beginning of 1931. In 1932, the Academy entered into an agreement with the University Library of Tübingen to obtain the nearly 300 letters of Gautier addressed to Nöldeke. The letters were duly sent and copied at the Secretariat after office hours, while two scholars, Bernard Heller, Gautier's former student and the compiler of his bibliography, and the future Iranist and linguist, the young Zygmunt Telegdi, entered words in non-Latin scripts in the copies. Telegdi's compensation, because he was very young at that time, was that he was allowed to borrow some books of his interest from the otherwise non-lending library. In addition to Bernard Heller, 
Kara's cataloging work was also held by the literary historian and journalist Bela Pukanski. It is due to their painstaking efforts that the correspondence was arranged into 47 boxes and an alphabetical list of all the correspondence was compiled. We cannot be grateful enough for this heroic work without which the coherent and meaningful transformation of this correspondence to the digital platform carried out 10 years ago would have been an impossible task considering the number of the letters. The Goldsier Room was inaugurated on the 18th of October, 1933 by the president of the Academy. In his speech, Albert Berzewitz emphasized that the opening of the room for the use of Hungarian and foreign scholars alike was necessitated by two things, the interest the vast correspondence may generate and the lack of funds at the Academy to publish the hitherto unedited manuscripts of Goldsier. The December 1933 issue of the Ungarische Jahrbücher contained a two-page description of the contents of the Goldsier Room written by Béla Pukanski, one of the catalogers. Another, more detailed overview of the Goldsier collection was given by Joseph de Somodi in his aforementioned article. Pukanski's description was sent by the Academy to 40 leading scholars of Islamic studies in Europe who in their responses showed great enthusiasm for the opening of this collection. However, in the aftermath of the Second World War, and for those of you who are not familiar with the building, this is the uh, building of the Academy next to the chain bridge in uh, Pest. So uh, in the aftermath of the Second World War, several rooms dedicated to various special collections in the Academy Palace could not be reopened as both the Academy Palace and the collections housed there were severely damaged. The Gautier room was used for a certain time immediately after the war as the kitchen of the Secretary General, as we can learn from a notice of the director of the library who was alerted to this fact by one of the members of the Academy. Since the Secretary General removed the correspondence and other manuscripts from the room without any prior notification of the director of the library, he further noted that he himself tried to reunite the dispersed objects. It is hoped that the online cataloging and digitizing of the Gautier archive, uh, which happened uh, last year, as I already told you, which was carried out uh, will bring to light some items which were thought to have been lost. Thus, the years following the Second World War were mainly spent by repairing the war damaged building, while the years uh, 1950 53 saw major transformations together with the renovation of certain interiors. At this time, a special oriental collection was opened on the ground floor. And the contents of the Goldsier room were, amongst others, incorporated into the holdings of this collection, which at the same time meant that the Goldsier room ceased to function forever, together with other collections, which, as I mentioned, had until the Second World War been open to the public. Removal from the public eye, however, did not go hand in hand with the loss of interest in the collection. Now, uh, probably you will find that this was a too long introduction, so let us turn our attention uh, to the life of the correspondence in the online environment. This was a major step in making accessible the correspondence to the widest possible public about 10 years ago in 12, uh, 2012 and 2013. The aim of the project, which enjoyed the support of the National Cultural Fund, was not only to create over 13,000 cataloging records, but to fully digitize the letters and make the resulting nearly 30,000 images freely accessible. As we know, the digital environment is constantly changing. When uh, in 2012, the Oriental Collection embarked upon the online cataloging, the library of the Academy was using a special Hungarian version of Mark called Hunmark. 
Within the large database, records had to be entered into a sub database, which became completely integrated into the main database during the transformation of the library's cataloging system from this Hungarian version of MARC to MARC 21 a few years later. This also resulted in the system numbers of the letters uh, written with in pencil and in the right corner becoming obsolete within a short period of time, but they are still visible in the upper right corner of the images as you can also see them. So hardly anyone knowing what they refer to. The numbers in the upper left corner However, refer to the envelope numbers of the letters are stored in the boxes, followed by their sequence number within the envelope, but they do not contain a reference to the boxes, which is a shortcoming. Uh, now I have just realized that. The cataloging, quite exceptionally for Hungary at that time, was done in English. Uh, in view of serving a wider public. A few years later, the images with some metadata were integrated into the digital repository of the library. Today, thanks to uh, Primo, the two locations can be searched together, as you can see it on this slide, uh, which mentions here Noldeka's letter to Ignaz Kortzier, just uh, an, as an example, and it says uh, uh, Akademie Könyvtar, which is the library of the Academy and the Oriental Collection Reading Room, and there is online access, but here it says that the letters are also contained in the repository called Real. Furthermore, the records were uploaded in 2017 to WordCamp, giving more people easier access to this legacy. The structure of the records is visible on this slide, and probably there is, it is not so interesting that we should deal with it any longer. Uh, and here is how a record looks like. The previous brief survey of Gaultier's manifolded work and scholarly interests was presented in order to raise awareness of the complexity of his correspondence. Before showing some statistics, may I remind you that the political map of Europe, and for that matter, the world, had been in constant change during Gaultier's lifetime. So it is well nigh impossible to provide country statistics, but I tried. I used this map as my starting point, deviating from it in certain cases. The correspondence contains letters in 10 languages. The total number is slightly more than the total number of letters, since sometimes several languages were used within one letter. As often, often happens with statistics, the figures are difficult to interpret in themselves. The preponderance of the usage of German language, in addition to the elevated status of German in the 19th century in scholarly correspondences, also comes from the fact that Gautier's major partners, who each wrote several hundreds of letters, usually corresponded in that language. If we examine the letters written by certain individuals, it is to be noted that the language they use may also change. It is the case, for example, of Arminius Vanberry, who sent to Gaultier 30 fairly long letters in German from a total of 79 letters. The varying use of languages is well exemplified by the exchange of letters between Gaultier and Duncan B. MacDonald, professor of the Hartford Theological Seminary, who generally wrote in English while Gaultier in German. And this is one of the correspondences when we, where we have both sides. Concerning the distribution of languages and the number of letters, it should be mentioned that out of the total number of over 13,000 letters, 752 are visiting cards, which may or may not contain handwritten notes. So for example, uh, from the French communications of which you can see the number here, over a hundred are visiting cards, more exactly 114 are visiting cards. It may also be interesting to note uh, that from among the Hungarian uh, letters, uh, only 
1,432 were written from the present day territory of Hungary. Speaking about the languages of the correspondence allowed me to make a short detour to shed light on the intricate linguistic situation in the region in the 19th century. There is a very interesting early letter in the collection written in 1865 in Hungarian by a certain Moritz de Sauer. The young de Sauer as assisted uh, Rabbi Yusuf Guggenheimer with whom Gautier studied Talmud as a child. As such, he is mentioned by Gautier also in his diary. De Sauer sent altogether 15 letters to Gautier, the overwhelming majority of which were in German, two in Hebrew, and uh, this only long letter in Hungarian. Maurice de Sauer was the son of Gabriel de Sauer, who was born in the town of Nitra. Um, this is the first town here on the map, uh, now in Slovakia, and who was for 40 years the rabbi of a locality not far from Lake Balaton uh, in Hungary at that time and uh, today as well called Balaton Fökpajár. This is the second uh, name on uh, the slide. His son Morit, so the correspondent of Gautier, was born in West Town. He pursued his Talmudic studies as nearby Várpalota and Gautier's hometown, Székesfehérvár, which is the fourth on the old list, and attended subsequently the rabbinical seminary and the university at the then Prussian town of Breslau. In 1871, he went as a preacher to Kötchen, uh, becoming in 1881 a district rabbi at Meiningen. The letter in question was written during his studies in Breslau, so now in Poland, as a reply to the 15-year-old Gautier's inquiry concerning his future studies. The letter is also noteworthy from the point of view that Dassauer clearly explains it the reasons why he left Hungary for good, a move which Gautier refused to do throughout his life. But of course, we shouldn't forget that this was uh, before the emancipation of Jews in Hungary. The letter was written in great, great haste uh, on the 10th of April uh, in the year 1865, uh, just before the beginning of the Passover holiday. The fact that the Sauer had found time to write to Gautier shows how much he was moved by his Hungarian letter, which is also expressed in his answer. Let me quote this letter briefly. Dear friend, it is painful that in Prussia, I must gradually alienate myself from our strong, beautiful sounding oriental spirited language. But as between two evils, the lesser should be chosen, I went abroad where I could get acquainted with the state and trends of general culture and breed trained in the sciences that interest the whole educated world so that I could enter life as a human being. The Hungarian element steps back and our smooth language can only live in books and in my bosom. It is no wonder then that your lively lines cause such a great impact on my Hungarian heart that when I incidentally picked up your letter today and read it again, I was so enraptured that despite my many things, which always multiply at the end of the semester, I took my pen to write to you, my dear friend, to answer in our beautiful, dignified language. As for your studies, you must hurry to read Odyssey and Xenophon in Greek, Virgil and Livy in Latin. In other subjects, you will probably meet the requirements of the entrance exam. Uh, let's not forget that Gautier was 15 at that time. Otherwise, life in both the Institute and the city is beautiful and free. I must hurry up my friend and take care of the needs for Passover for which holiday I wish you and your good parents and sister the best. I remain your loving friend, the Sauer. Coming back to the statistics, we can continue with the list of countries by mentioning that Gautier was in correspondence with people from 39 countries. He received less than a hundred letters from 25 countries while more than 100 letters from 14 countries. 
21 scholars wrote more than 100 letters each. At the top of this list, here at the bottom, um, you will find Christian Snuhorganya, uh, followed by Theodor Nöldeke and Martin Hartmann. The most important Hungarian person was the famous scholar and chief rabbi of Szeged, Immanuel Löw, while at the end of this line, here at the top, uh, there is Viktor von Rosen, uh, the well-known Arabist of St. Petersburg. To close the st statistics, I would like to show uh, you a chart showing the number of letters received by Gaultier between the years 1863 until the end of his life and even beyond that. As you can see, the year 1910 was a peak when he received 730 letters. The occasion of the influx of communications was his 60th birthday, which received national and international recognition. Disregarding this exceptional year where messages were sent by people with whom he did not correspond, correspond regularly. As an established scholar between the years 18, 95 until the outbreak of the First World War, he received an average of 400 letters per year. This is what I wanted to allude to uh, in the title of this talk, that is to say, irrespective of the distance of his correspondence, Goldziher, who never wanted to leave Hungary, felt surrounded by them as if they were in his proximity. With the outbreak of the war, this secure and frequent communication received a serious blow and came to a halt with many of his correspondents who lived in enemy countries, which resulted in Gaultier feeling intellectual famine and isolation. The, the two dates in my title also need some explanation. I have already referred to the first one, the year 1863, when the first letter preserved in the correspondence arrived from his teacher, Moses Wolf Freidenberg. The other date was 1922, when shortly after Gaultier's death, on the 24th of January, the Ministry of Public Instruction in Tehran dispatched a letter on behalf of the Najafi scholar Abdulaziz al Jawahiri who was collecting data for his Encyclopedia and Twelve Ashis, which appeared under the title Athera Shia Limamiya in Tehran in 1924. However, this was not the last letter sent to Gaultier after his death. In 1923, two booksellers would have liked to contact him to obtain copies of his Richtungen and the volume from the Gibb Memorial series, which they hoped he had received as a gift and with which he would be happy to dispense. It may be interesting to mention that the Leipzig bookseller and antiquarian Paul Köhler sent another postcard two years later in 1925, this time asking for one of his clients for a copy of Gaultier's article on Islamic law, which appeared in a German journal on comparative law. This card closes the long line of letters sent to Ignaz Gortziher. In the same year, a more interesting letter was sent to Gortziher's son, Karoy, by Mohammed Zubay Siddiqui, a young scholar from the Indian state of Bihar who obtained his PhD degree at the University of Cambridge under the supervision of Edward G. Brown. During his studies in Europe, he got acquainted with Gaultier's oeuvre and now asked permission of Gaultier's son to translate some of it to Urdu, hoping that he will not ask for any royalties. In this context, it is also important to mention that in his later book on Hadith, Siddiqui refers to Gaultier 90 times and quite often approvingly. Finally, uh, let me present some glimpses of Gaultier's correspondence with Middle Eastern and North African scholars. Uh, this as also as a reply to a former previous question uh, asked in one of the uh, lectures, previous lectures here. Um, 
This relatively small part of his correspondence was selected because also because it sheds lights on Voltaire's personality and human contact. Voltaire was attached to the Middle East not only because of his scholarly interest, but also because of his very positive personal experiences there during both his study tour in the region and his trip with the, much later with a group of high school teachers in Egypt. During his study tour, uh, the first uh, study tour, oh, sorry, I went backwards. Uh, during his study tour in 1873-74, he made lasting friendships in Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, and Egypt. Several scholars wrote to him in connection with his or their chorus publications. Uh, here are some of these, uh, just uh, as an example. Uh, really, uh, just, uh, to mention some of his contacts uh, in the Middle East. He also met notable persons from the Middle East in Budapest who wanted to keep in touch with him, not least because of his amicable personality. To these persons belonged Abdul Baha, the eldest son of Baha'u'llah, who visited Budapest in April 1913 at the invitation of the Hungarian Theosophical Society. In addition to writing to Gaultier after their meeting, he also sent him a Persian rug as a token of their friendship. The correspondence also reflects Gaultier's cordial nature. He was ready to help his correspondents in a wide range of scholarly issues, putting his indefatigable brain at their disposal. It is also a treasure trove that can be explored from various aspects, as has already been proven by several publications to which papers delivered during various conferences also added their share lately. Although Gaultier was often described as working silently in his retreat, he was fond of being in the company of his friends and students and appears to have been an overwhelmingly sociable person. Despite all his difficulties and often tedious obligations, which limited the time he could dedicate to research, he always showed compassion to those who approached him for whatever reason. He stimulated his helpless or discouraged students and never made them feel his intellectual superiority. On the contrary, from the, from the letters of his students, the image of a lenient professor emerges. His rare predisposition to natural modesty in a scholar of his stature can serve as an inspiration and an example for all of us to follow. This is why I would like to close my talk with a postcard selected from among the several communication with his students. This particular student, who later became an eminent rabbi in a country town, was on his way into his hometown for the holidays and had to change trains at this juncture, during which time he remembered his professor and sent him this card. I wish we all had such students. And I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. And I do hope that I did not uh, stretch your special time.